I now have a very special treat in store for you. Uh, an amazing woman is going to speak to us, be our keynote speaker this evening. Carol Everett is truly a unique individual at such a time as this, as it's stated in Esther 414. She comes to us from a different place in time with a dramatic story that continues as she contributes to the pro-life movement. Carol Everett knows firsthand about pregnancy termination, having been both a consumer and a provider. She was involved in the operation of four abortion clinics from 1977 to 1983, overseeing 35,000 pregnancy terminations. Carol, however, experienced a total transformation in her life when she came to know Jesus Christ as her personal savior. Today, she is committed to safeguarding the health of women and their babies all over this nation. She also speaks to the men and women who have experienced a pregnancy loss to offer a message of healing and hope. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and privilege to present Carol Everett. Good evening. I am a Texan, I suppose you can tell. And you've heard about Texans, haven't you? You can always tell a Texan, but you can't tell them much. What a wonderful meal, what a wonderful evening, and what a wonderful surprise to know that that van is there and paid for. Or it's not a van, it's a mobile unit, I'm sorry. And this ministry is going to spread out again. And I think it was so effective to talk about how, uh, what a smaller percentage of the cost it will be, will be used to spread the message. It's, it's exciting to be part of this. You see, I want to thank you for coming tonight because you have come to an event that is part of a missionary outreach to your streets. Uh, we appreciate people who go to Russia and Africa, but this is to the streets of Las Vegas, your hometown. Thank you for caring. Thank you for being here. I came from the other side. I sold abortions. How do you sell an abortion? Well, sadly, it's a little too simple. You've heard about it. These kids shouldn't have sex, but they're going to have sex, so let's teach them how to have safe sex or safer sex. The next time you hear that, I just want you to use that old Texas term, baloney. <laughs> we don't take our kids out, get them really good and drunk, and try to teach them how to drive safely drunk. We give them a moral absolute, don't drink and drive for you could be killed. Why in the world would we offer them a low moral standard to live down to rather than the very highest and best absence until marriage, which still works every single time? Yeah. I'm glad to have so many youth here tonight, and there are a couple of things I want you to learn tonight. One is to uh, develop some antenna. Now, what are antenna? Anytime someone tries to get you to laugh at their parents and their values, I want you to remember they're trying to sell you something that is not good for you. Flee from that. Go home and tell your parents. And the other thing is anytime anyone tries to tell you how to have sex safely or tells you sex can be safe outside of marriage, I want you to run home and tell your parents quickly. Flee from that. Uh, the other thing is some of you probably don't want to talk to your parents about sex. Well, trust me, your parents don't want to talk to you about sex either. <laughs> but they are the ones you should talk to because they are the ones who care for you and love you and make those rules because they care. So run home and talk to them when you hear someone like me. Now, our goal was three to five abortions between the ages of 13 and 18. And you can't just go to girls when they're 12 and say, I want you to start getting pregnant next year. You have to start much earlier than that. You have to break down the natural modesty. You have to become the expert in their lives, and you have to separate them from their parents and their values. And how do you do all of that? Well, sex education sells abortions, and we started in kindergarten. Now, in kindergarten, they just put the kids in a circle and go around the room, and they ask a very simple question. What do you say to call your private parts? Well, you know and I know every family in the world in this room has a different name for their private parts. 
So by the time you reach the third or fourth child, it is clear to those children their parents do not know what they have. <laughs> but we did. And we said, okay, boys, this is what you have, and girls, this is what you have, and don't be ashamed of your private parts, and you could look out on that playground, and they were sharing. <laughs> We'd done it. They were starting to question their parents and their values. We started to break down the natural modesty, and we were becoming the sex experts in their lives. First, second, and third grade, we used at that time little square books with nude bodies, six- and seven-year-old nude bodies with diagrams to show them how to have intercourse, one book per classroom. I'm delighted to tell you they don't use that book anymore, but they have pornography for kids in another form. They have a book that's for four-year-olds called It's Not the Stork by Robbie Harris. They have a book for seven-year-olds, and I get these two confused. It's so amazing. And then one for 10-year-olds, it's perfectly normal. All three of those books are by Robbie Harris. And I would encourage you to go to your local libraries, to your schools. I would ask you to ask to see the sex education material for you will be shocked at what you will find in the public libraries and in your schools. We ran out of those books at our office recently, and I went to Barnes & Noble to purchase them. And when I got there, they were in the children's section on the shelf at the floor. I had to sit on the floor to get those books. But as an old grandmother, I bought every single one they had. I know they replaced them, but I did my part that day. So. In the fourth grade, children are, are encouraged to masturbate alone and then in groups of four or five the same sex. Tell me that's normal. And then in the fifth and sixth grade, I came in. And my goal was simple. Now we had to get them sexually active. We had to get them on a low-dose birth control pill they would get pregnant on, and we had to pass out defective condoms or second condoms to those boys. Our goal was three to five abortions between the ages of 13 and 18. And so I had to get them laughing at their parents. I had to get them nodding with me. I had to be the one that was the smart one here. And so I would say, you, your parents don't understand you, do they? And of course, half of them thought they didn't. You're, how many of you are mad at your parents right now? Half of them would raise their hands. And I would say, well, have you talked about sex with your parents? Actually, have you picked out somebody you'd like to have sex with? If you started having sex with that person, would your parents help you get some sort of protection to keep you from getting pregnant? Don't worry about that. Here's my card. Licensed counselors, telephone answered 24 hours a day. No one knew, we just sold one product. But this is the sad part. The next day, those girls would call. Maybe they couldn't drive. They would get to our clinic and we would prescribe that low dose birth control pill that we knew they would get pregnant on. Now, how did we do that? We prescribed a birth control pill that was such a low dose that in order to provide any level of protection, it had to be taken accurately at the same time every single day. For we knew one thing about teens, they don't do anything at the same time every day. We actually looked at the statistics and we could tell that any time those girls went on any method of contraception, that sexual activity went from zero or once a week to five to seven times a week, that pill would not work. We could accomplish our goal of three to five abortions between the ages of 13 and 18. I'm sorry to tell you I held the hand of one young woman while she had her ninth abortion. Abortion is a method of birth control in this country, a 43% repeat rate. 43% repeat rate. And now she's pregnant. Who is she going to call? My telephone is going to ring. And when that telephone rang, it was answered by telemarketers. They sold over the telephone. That's the point of sale for an abortion, the telephone. We couldn't call them telemarketers. That's far too insensitive. We called them telephone counselors. And they used a script, a script designed to overcome every single objection. That's what sales is, isn't it? Overcome the objection, and you get the order, in this case, the abortion. And this poor, scared girl would confess, I think I may be pregnant. And this telephone counselor would get her script, and the first line was reassure. We can take care of your problem. No one needs to know. The first real question is, what's the first day of your last normal period? This poor, scared girl may or may not have figured that. She gives it to the so-called counselor 
who puts it on a wheel designed to calculate the birth date of the baby, but if she doesn't say birth date or baby, she says you're eight weeks pregnant. What did she do? She just confirmed this young woman's worst fear. I'm pregnant. You'd think she'd say, stop, how can you tell me over the telephone that I'm pregnant? But my friends, this is the pregnancy expert. That seed is planted, that fear is confirmed. The next question is, is good news or bad news? If it were good news, she would not be calling an abortion clinic. It's bad news. And when she replies bad news, this counselor moves right in. But now she's simply identifying the fear. Why the fear? Oh, she's going to use it. She's going to use it to sell that abortion anytime that young woman moves away. Your parents don't have to know. You don't have to miss school. You don't have to drop out of work. The girl blurts out what the fear is, not realizing she's just armed that counselor with everything she needs to sell that abortion over and over again. Get your money, come on in. If abortions are so good for women, why aren't they free? Because this is still the largest unregulated legal industry in the nation today, second only to illegal drugs. We don't have any idea what the abortion industry really amounts to in this country, for because it's a cash business, so much can be just ripped off and unreported. While in this room tonight, we are having a great time. There are girls and women across the city, across the state, across this nation, counting and counting and recounting their money. For in the morning, they plan to walk through the door of an abortion clinic. They weren't fortunate enough to find the Women's Resource Center, the medical clinics. Abortions in this nation cost from $300 in Iowa to $12,000 for a second or third trimester abortion in California. Abortions are completed through all nine months of pregnancy, not because of Roe v. Wade, but because of Doe v. Bolton, the companion case of Roe, the case out of Georgia, heard the very same day that said for the health of the mother, an abortion can be completed through all nine months of pregnancy. You see, we understood that health encompassed mental health. So we would say to this frightened young woman, you would have problems with this pregnancy should you carry it to term, wouldn't you? She would say yes, and we'd chart it anxiety, emotional health, The biggest baby I ever held still was 32 weeks. That baby clearly could have lived outside its mother's uterus. You see, you have to have someone that does the hands and maneuver when the abortionist is doing the abortion. You have to say, okay, the head's here, the buttocks are here, and you push the baby into the instruments. The big baby abortions are, abortions are done first. Why are they done first? Because they, that woman needs to stay in recovery longer. She's going to lose more blood, more fluids. She'll need to stay in recovery for two to three hours where a woman having a first trimester abortion can usually leave within 30 minutes. The abortionist fee in the second and third trimester is 50% of the cost of the abortion. So for that $12,000 abortion, the abortionist pockets $6,000. But he can do three of those an hour. $18,000 an hour. Oh, oh, they don't all do that. We know that over 90% of abortions are first trimester abortions. Let's just use that cheapest abortion in the nation at $300. But in the first trimester, the abortionist fee is a third of the fee, $100. But we had a technique to keep him doing 10 to 12 abortions an hour. We used two teams of two assistants with each abortionist. And the first team would set up the first young woman and the doctor would go in to do that abortion while across the hall, abortion number two was readied. Now, when he finished that first abortion, he ran across the hall. He didn't stop to do operative notes. He didn't stop to do a surgical scrub. He went right in to do that abortion, re-gloved, changed gloves, did that second abortion. While in the first room, they had to get the first girl out. They had to clean the room and get girl number three up. So when he came across the hall in less than five minutes, he could start abortion number three. 